for those of you who haven't been with us, we have been uh, taking this semester to go through uh, the letter of James, and we are actually uh, nearing the end. We will actually be concluding uh, this series next week. So once again, that's James chapter 5, verses 7 to 11. Uh, the, t the title of this message is The Call to Patience. James chapter 5, verses 7 to 11. If you have found your places, please stand with me at this time out of reverence for God's word. Please give your full and undivided atten attention to the reading of God's holy word, starting with verse 7. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. This is the word of God. You may be seated. And let's once again bow our heads and ask God to give us help, insight, and illumination into his word. Uh, Father, we confess that we are an impatient people, and uh, we confess that we are an impatient people because oftentimes we are an unbelieving people, trusting in our own devices, trusting in our, our own methods and experiences, Father, we pray that as we look upon this call to patience, uh, that we would not only learn about uh, what patience is, but that, Lord, you would bear this fruit of patience uh, within us, God, that we would learn to trust in you, that we would learn to submit and surrender ourselves to your purposes and your plans, even if we don't get the answer that we want this side of heaven. God, help us to know that you are always for us and that you are always faithful to us. And so I pray for all of my brothers and sisters here, especially in their seasons of waiting. God, I pray that your presence, God, would uphold them and empower them and enable them to live the lives that you have called them to live. And so we pray for the preaching and the hearing of your word. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, when we ask one another, how are you uh, these days, I think that one of the most common answers that we give one another besides the pseudo, I'm good, is our real and true answer, uh, which is oftentimes, I'm busy right? Uh, I think that all of us can confess that we are a very busy people, personally, but even just corporately as a society. Uh, and because we are busy as people, we are also a very impatient people. We don't like to wait. We don't like to wait for anything. We want to move at a very fast pace. We're always in a hurry, always in a rush. There's always too much to do and too little time. Uh, we are all about being more and more efficient. Time is our most valuable resource because it's the one resource that we could never get back. And so whatever uh, we think is a waste of time, uh, it begins to annoy us. Think of just being in a grocery store and uh, having to uh, wait in a long line. That frustrates us. It irritates us. It annoys us. When you're driving uh, on the road, when there's traffic, and especially when you're in the left lane and someone's going slow in the left lane, we want them to just get the heck out of our way. 
Uh, you know, when we're waiting for simple things like an oil change that's supposed to take a couple minutes and then it takes over an hour, we get very upset, we get very frustrated. Uh, no longer do we want to, you know, wait a long time for good food. We want fast food. We want instant food. Uh, we don't want to take long hours to go shopping in the malls. We want to do it online. We want the free shipping. We want the fast shipping. We want the one-day shipping. Even when we think about our language, we don't want to waste time. And so we see that even with our language, we use a lot of abbreviations, right? Uh, we say things like ASAP. We don't want to say as soon as possible. We say ASAP. You know, what is your ETA? Uh, RSVP. Uh, we like to shorten a lot of words. Even when we write a text message, we want to use abbreviations. LOL or BRB or TMI or, you know, there are these newer ones that you young people use like IKR. I didn't know what that meant, but it means, uh, actually, I don't even know what it means, but I think it's I, I know, right? Is that what it is? Or TY, it stands for thank you. We don't have time to write it all out, and so we use abbreviations. Even in the Korean language, most of you in here, uh, you're familiar with our texting platform called Kakao Talk. We don't call it Kakao Talk. It's too long to say, so we just say Ka Talk. Or um, actually even this morning in our first service, uh, the senior pastor, he said that there's an abbreviation for digital camera. It's called Dika. It's digital camera, and so the Koreans call it Dika. And so we see that we don't want to waste any time. We are very rushed. We are always in a hurry. We want to be as efficient as possible. When we think about, you know, even the internet, we hate when there's lag. We want things to be as, like, quick as possible. We want things to be done in milliseconds. Now, I don't want to sound like the old guy, but back in my day, we had dial-up internet. We had dial-up modem internet, which literally, it was like the beeping of landline phones and, um, yeah, when we compare that to the speeds that we have now, that's everything is wireless. You know, I was so amazed when um, so my very first iPhone was the iPhone 4, and it was so amazing that you could do this thing called FaceTime, where you could literally, uh, in real time, uh, video chat with someone all the way across the world. It was just so revolutionary. Now we look back at the iPhone, we think that it's, it's like a slow piece of junk. We're already on the iPhone 11. We see that speed, it has become so advanced and again, the, the little bit, the littlest bit of lag, it begins to annoy us because we're so busy and impatient. And so there's that saying, stop and smell the roses. Are we able to actually uh, stop and smell the roses, actually enjoy life at, at a pace that uh, we were meant to live? Or are we always so busy, always so irritated uh, with waiting? I think that not only are we impatient with things like these in life, but because we are so impatient with things like these in life, we also begin to translate that to our impatience towards God. Just as gadgets like phones or internet is supposed to get faster and faster, we also attribute that to God. God, aren't you supposed to answer me a little bit faster now? Aren't you supposed to do what I say like in the moment when I want? And that's how we actually become jaded in our spiritual lives when God doesn't actually work according to the the time scale that uh, we envision him to work at. In our passage today, James, he tells us to be patient. Now, what exactly is patience? Is patience just learning to be laid back? Is patience just learning how to wait without getting irritated? Is patience like learning to live on a rural farm? Or is there something more. As we look at today's passage, I pray that we would, once again, not only learn what patience is,
But I pray that we would actually grow in this fruit of patience that God actually provides for us. And so as we go through today's passage, we're going to go over three main points. We're going to talk about patience with perspective, second, patience with people, and then finally, patience with purpose. And so uh, if we could turn to our uh, first slide, uh, patience with perspective. Uh, We see that patience comes as we look back on God. Let's look at verse 7. It says, Be patient, therefore. Now, before we look at what therefore is referring to, let's first look at the word patient. Patience, um, it is a compound word uh, in the Greek called makrothumeo. And uh, we can kind of see where we get English uh, translations from that. Macro means big or long. And then thumio is where we get the word like thermometer. And so macro thumio, when you put it together, it's like taking a long time to get heated. That's what it means to be patient, taking a long time to get heated or impatient or angry. And so some translations uh, for patience, it uses the phrase like long suffering or forbearance. Uh, And so it says, be patient. Take a long time, take big time to actually get heated or angry. So it says, be patient, therefore. What does therefore mean? It always means to look back. It means to look back, not only at uh, what is immediately proceeding, but look way back. Look way back to things that are even forgotten. So what is the immediate thing that we should look back at? In this immediate context, If we remember from last week, at the beginning of chapter 5, James, he talks about these uh, workers who um, have fraud against them because of these uh, domineering landlords. And so in James chapter 5, verse 4, it says, Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields which you have kept back by fraud are crying out against you and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the lord of hosts and so this is what james is calling us to look back on he's saying that your cries in your suffering they do not fall on deaf ears your cries in times of injustice they do not just simply go into the air your cries have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. And we all know that life gets tough. You will go through suffering. Again, I I shared with many of you that uh, one of our uh, fellow pastors in our presbytery, um, yeah, he had heart failure and uh, there were complications in his surgery and so he had liver failure and kidney failure. And again, we think that we're invincible especially when we're young. We think that we have our whole lives ahead of us. We are a vapor. We are a mist you know, that will soon be vanished. We go through times of suffering. We go through times of sickness. We go through times of loneliness. We go through times of depression. We may even go through times of terminal illness. And what gives you the patience to get you through those seasons of trials it's knowing that God hears you that God knows you that God is there with you that your cries have reached the Lord of hosts so look back on this verse and not only look back on this verse look back on your life you know even looking back on your own life Think about the times that God has been faithful to you in your life that you may have forgotten about. You know, even when I look back on my life, it's so easy to gloss over the times when God has been so faithful, where God has worked miracles in my life. It's so easy to just look back on the times of difficulty, the times of trials, the times of suffering. You know, when I look back even to times of unemployment God has been faithful when I look back to 
times of sickness, God has been faithful. As you look back on your life, would you not gloss over the times that God has answered your cries, the times that God has been faithful to his promises, but have a bird's eye view of your life so that you could be reminded of the testimonies in your life. Look back even further than that. Look back maybe even upon your family, how God may have been faithful to your family. As I look back on my family, I have to realize that, you know, I'm a fifth generation Christian, that God was faithful to allow the gospel to go to my great, great grandfather so that faith could be passed down to a fifth generation great great grandson such as me god he always has been faithful maybe not in your immediate past but even when you look back far enough we can always see that god has been faithful look back to even further than your specific family look at look back at the history of the church when we see that the church, even though it's gone through persecution, even though it's gone through the dark ages, that God has been faithful to his church. God has been building up his church. When we look back to our forefathers in the faith, God has been faithful to people like Moses. God has been faithful to people like Joseph. God has been faithful to people like David. God has been faithful to people like the prophets and the disciples, people like Apostle Paul. God has been faithful. So patience requires us to look back, to have perspective. Patience is not just about your personality. Patience is about having a bigger perspective. But patience comes not only as we look back, it's also as we look forward to God. Uh, verse 7 says, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Two times, he uses the phrase, until the coming of the Lord. And this is another perspective that we need to have in order for us to be patient. Not only looking back to what God has done, but looking forward to what he has promised. And pers another word for perspective could be the word worldview. The way that you view the world. All people have a worldview. And if you want to really boil it down, there are one of two main worldviews. One worldview is that I'm king. Another worldview is that God is king. If I'm king, I will always be impatient because there are things that get in my way. There are things that are not going according to my plan. But if God is king, if my worldview is that God is king, I can always be patient because I know that God is working all things for his good. We wake up every single morning forgetting that God is king. Even as believers, we wake up every morning forgetting that God is king. Every morning, we wake up thinking that I'm king or I'm queen. We think we run the world. We think that we are in charge of our lives. But God runs the world. God is in control of our lives. As the kid's song says, He's got the whole world in his hands. You know, with all the talk about global warming, there are still God-given seasons. God brings the blistering heat. God brings the pouring rain. God brings the bright sun. God brings the white snow. God brings the yellow leaves. God brings the green grass. God brings the blue skies. God brings the dark clouds. Yes, there's pollution and CO2 emissions that can affect temperatures on this earth, but God is the one that's spinning it. God is the one that's revolving it. God is the one that has the world in his hands. And God, he uses a lot of these 
agricultural analogies and that's why he talks about the farmer waiting for precious fruit i mean this doesn't apply to us um you know none of us are farmers but god he is not a microwave god god is more of a farmer and he uses these agricultural analogies on purpose to let us know that we ought to be patient like a farmer god doesn't work in seconds god oftentimes works in seasons god works in years god works in generations his time is not always like the time that we want and oftentimes as a farmer there are waiting periods for the harvest and we need to understand that the waiting season it's not a wasted season that even in waiting there is something that is growing that there is something that is being produced even when we can't see it even if it's underneath the surface that the waiting season is not wasted it's like pregnancy you know it looks like nothing's happening but we know that life is being created that cells are being multiplied that a heart is beating even when you can't see it likewise in our periods of waiting when we think that god is not active that god is not doing something god is always doing something there's this uh phrase that i heard that uh, i really think applies to our mentality of god it says that we serve a crockpot god in a microwave generation i think we need to once again be reminded that we serve a crockpot god in a microwave generation we need to understand that god's delays are not god's denials and so look forward look forward not just to your immediate future but look forward to the distant future not just to tomorrow or next week or next month or next year or next decade look forward to a hundred years from now where are you going to be in a hundred years we ought to look forward to glory we ought to look forward to heaven we ought to look forward to the coming of the lord keep your eye on that finish line keep your eye on the end goal looking into the far future helps us to live the immediate future by faith so lamentations 3 verse 25 it says the lord is good to those who wait for him we don't just wait just for the time to just pass by we wait in faith we wait in trust knowing that the lord will be coming and so the end of verse 8 it says to establish your hearts strengthen your hearts prepare your hearts set your hearts on his promises that he has given to you and then also patience it comes as we obey god we need to understand that patience it's not a feeling patience is a choice you know three times it talks about uh it says be patient or being patient and so two times it is a commanding imperative uh, and at one time it's an active participle but all in all these three times be patient or being patient it's talking about a choice it's not talking about a feeling we can choose to have a god-centered perspective and we obey ultimately because we trust you know when i was younger sometimes i would you know go somewhere with my dad and then he would have to go off and do something really quickly and so he would leave me at a certain spot and he'd say stay right here i'll be back in a minute and you know when he would do that and after a minute would pass uh, my heart would start to uh, beat faster i'm like where is he, he said that he's gonna be back but even though the literal minute has passed i trusted that he would be back and so maybe after two or three minutes he would be back and he you know maybe did not didn't keep his uh word uh literally but he 
kept his word. He, and I could trust that uh, when my father says that he will be back, that he will be back. God says the same thing to us. Now, that's not saying that the Lord will be back in a minute, but he's saying that he will be back. If you believe that the Lord is coming, you will be patient. If you don't believe, you will always be impatient. And one of the main reasons why we are impatient is because we trust our perspective too much. We trust uh, our timeline. We trust our experiences. And so oftentimes the opposite of patience is frustration. And that's you know, where we oftentimes uh, show our lack of faith when our needs aren't, ex- uh, aren't met when we expect. And so have a perspective looking back on God's faithfulness and also looking forward to the fulfillment of his promises. Second, let's look at patience with people. And we see that James, he calls us to be patient with people. In verse 9, he says, Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. When we grumble, that is the first sign that um, our faith crumbles. When we grumble, that is the first sign that our faith crumbles. People, they test our patience all the time. When your friend uh, makes fun of you, when your boss picks you apart, when your parent nags you, when your spouse criticizes you, when your child disobeys you. And this is to be expected because people are sinners. It's, it's so expected uh, that people will test our patience. But the sad reality is that this happens even in the church. Even in the church, people test our patience. Our brothers and sisters sitting right next to us begin to even test our patience. And so we grumble. And why do we grumble? We grumble because the people sitting right next to us don't meet our expectations. You know, all all of us, we are on the road of sanctification. We are all on this road of becoming more and more conformed to the image of Christ. But we expect people to be sanctified much faster than they already are. And I know deep down that is oftentimes my attitudes uh, with people as well. I grumble and I'm impatient with a brother or sister because I expect them to be more sanctified than they already are. And then God humbles me. And then God reminds me that I took so long to get to where I am. And he also reminds me that I have so much more to go, that I have a long, long way to go. Brothers and sisters, do not grumble against one another, but be patient with one another. As James said in chapter 1, be slow to speak, be slow to anger. Even when immaturity irritates you, even when slander is directed to you, even when someone lets you down, even when someone misunderstands you, that person may not deserve your patience, but you're called to be patient anyways. Why? Because God is always patient with us that way. We do not deserve God's patience, but the Bible says that God is slow to anger, that God is abounding in love. God is kind to us even when we don't deserve his kindness. So be patient with one another because God is so patient with you. Don't judge them. Rather think about God's judgment on you. God, how can I become better and not bitter? God, help me to love as you have loved me. God, help me to be patient with others to the extent that you have been patient with me. 
That ought to be our prayer. And we see that in the example in the prophets. The prophets, they suffer tremendously because of people. Verse 10, it says, As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Who are prophets? As it says, they are people who spoke in the name of the Lord. And you would think that people who spoke on behalf of the Lord, that they had a great life, that they had a wonderful, marvelous life. Actually, nothing could be further from the truth. Speaking in the name of the Lord did not prevent persecution. Oftentimes, it provoked persecution. God's people often did evil in the eyes of the Lord, falling into idolatry and ungodliness. And in order to bring them back, God, he raised up prophets who fearlessly told them of their sins. And these prophets were oftentimes abused and even killed because of this. Their teachings, their speaking was not well received and it was usually ignored. Nearly all the prophets, they suffered greatly. You know, we've been going through the book of Exodus, you know, on Fridays. And we saw that, you know, Moses, he was oftentimes criticized and blamed. Even after they crossed through the Red Sea, what happens? The people crumble. They complain. And they say that Moses made life worse for the Israelites. They want to go back to Egypt. They want to have, you know, pots of meat we see we saw you know this past summer joseph while he's not a quote-unquote prophet in a sense as a dreamer he was a spokesperson for god and we saw that he suffered he suffered through slavery imprisonment false accusations you know we look at someone like the prophet jeremiah and he found himself in the pit of a prison and it said that he was in the the miry mud sinking deep you know think about daniel who was put in the fiery furnace or put in a den of lions take a prophet like ezekiel who had to bear the punishment for israel and it says in chapter 4 of ezekiel that he had to lie on his left side for 390 days. Imagine being on your left side for 390 days over an entire year. He had to be on his left side. And then not only that, he wasn't finished. For a second time, he had to lie on his right side for 40 days over a month. His prophet suffered greatly. And I would think probably the prophet who suffered the greatest of all was the prophet Hosea who was called by God to take as his wife a prostitute, a whore, because God said that Israel was like a prostitute. And, you know, he had children through this prostitute. And he said, name your daughter no mercy. Say that I'm not going to have mercy on Israel. I'm going to have mercy on Judah. I'm not going to have mercy on Israel. And name your son not my people. And your wife, she's going to cheat on you. She's going to go to other lovers. But I'm going to still call you to pursue your wife. I'm going to call you to woo your cheating wife. He's saying be faithful to her even though she was unfaithful to you. And I would think that's probably the greatest suffering of all. So Matthew chapter 5, verse 12, Jesus said, They persecuted the prophets who were before you. Yet we see the example of these prophets that through it all, through the suffering and persecution, they remained patient. They endured it. They were steadfast in their prophetic ministry. And lastly, let's look at patience with a purpose. We ought to see that patience, it has a purpose. And the first purpose is that it would produce in us steadfastness. Let's look at verse 11. 
James says, Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord. Also earlier in James chapter 1, verse 2 uh, to 4, uh, we are reminded that he says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, then you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. What is steadfastness? Steadfastness is endurance or perseverance. And there's no way to be steadfast apart from suffering. Job, in no way uh, was he able to be steadfast apart from the trials and tribulations that he endured. No way did he bring it upon himself, but God allowed Satan to test Job's faithfulness to God. In Job chapter 1, you know, God, he said to Satan, look at this faithful man such as Job. And, you know, Satan, you know, he objected and he said, it's because you've blessed him. You've given him wealth and health and prosperity. Take these away and we'll see what happens. And God says, okay. I will allow you to take these things away. And we see that in one, one swoop, in one day, Satan was allowed to take away everything that he had. In one day, he lost his home, his children, his livestock, his health, his wealth. We see that all of his possessions were gone. All of his children were gone. His health was gone. He had boils on his body. And even his wife and his friends, they gave him no comfort. His wife went to Job and said, curse God and die, Job. And we see that his friends, while at, at first they were good friends, they, they sat with him for seven days. They, they wept with him. They didn't say anything. But then we see that they began to add to his sorrow instead of comforting him. And what was Job's reaction in all that? We see that he did not curse God. But just as we sang earlier, he said, God gives and takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We see that uh, he says that should we only take good things from God and not receive evil. And we, it says that Job, he did not sin with his lips. But we also see the humanness of Job. We do see that he in a sense, failed to a degree. After the seven days of mourning with his three friends, Job, he begins the conversation, and he actually does curse the day that he was born, and he charges God with unfairness since he did nothing to deserve the evil that had come upon him. And to a sense, he does fail. But the most important part was that he bore these troubles like a real man of God. Job, he still persevered through it all. He virtually lost everything, yet he never left God. And you know what? God never explains to Job the reason for his suffering. We as readers, we know the reason. But Job himself, he never got the answer from God. He never got the answer of his why questions. Tim Keller says, Job never saw why he suffered, but he saw God. And that was enough. And we see that God, in the end, he actually restores Job's life. God blessed the later days of Job more than his beginning, which leads us to our last point, which is that patience, the purpose of patience is also to reveal the mercy of God. At the end of verse 11, it says, You have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. We as people are all sinners who test God's patience every hour, every minute. Yet he is so merciful to us. He is so steadfast with us. He is so restraining of his wrath towards us. And just as God blessed the later days of Job more than his beginning, God is going to bless your later days more than your beginning. 
In Job 42, verse 12, it says, And the Lord blessed the later days of Job more than his beginning. God has an eternal inheritance waiting for you. The Lord is compassionate and merciful. What does the word compassion even mean? It means that God is with us in our suffering. I heard that the words uh, sympathy, empathy, and compassion, they are all synonyms but they're slightly different sympathy is when uh, you can have pity on someone and uh, you can feel sorry for someone empathy is identifying with someone's suffering because you have been in their shoes compassion is when you actually go into their shoes and walk with them and we see that the lord he has actually not only known about our sufferings, he has actually entered into them. That's why we say that God is Emmanuel. Maybe you are like Daniel and his friends in a season of fiery furnace. What do we see? We saw that God not only saw their afflictions, he actually entered into it, that he was right there with them identifying with them, and even protecting them from the flames of these afflictions so that they could actually feel his greater affections for him. The Lord is compassionate. He is merciful to you. He wants you to see his mercy. God is compassionate towards you. You know, and this past Friday, uh, we heard from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 4, that love is patient. God is compassionate, and he's loving towards you, and it is expressed through his patience. Patience is the first definition of love because I believe that this is the area where, of love where people actually fail the most. People can be good at romance. People can be kind people can not be rude but in our sinfulness we are so quick to lose our patience are we not but god never loses his patience god is infinitely patient towards us so much so that he says in second peter chapter 3 verse 9 it says the lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness but is patient toward you not wishing that any should perish but that all should reach repentance. Again, brothers and sisters, be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. And as we reflect upon the person of Job who suffered tremendously, we see that Job, he's not just an example that we follow, but he's actually someone who points to an even greater example, Jesus Christ. We see that Jesus Christ is the greater Job. Jesus Christ, he had far more wealth than Job ever had. And in one day, he lost it all. He lost all the glory of heaven. He came down to this earth. He came down to not only people who were suffering, he actually entered into our suffering so that he could be God, Emmanuel, so that in our afflictions, we could experience his affections and because he endured that for us it says that God would actually exalt him and give him the name above all names that at the name of Jesus every knee would bow every tongue would confess that he is the Lord one day the Lord will come back he will restore to you he will allow your later days to be be better than your former As Hebrews 12, verse 2 says, let us look to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He calls us as his his disciples to also bear the cross daily. But we do it because we look forward. We look to the distant future, to the joy that is set before us. And so as we live this life of trial and suffering let us be patient knowing that god is working all things for good let's bow our heads in prayer at this time
And before I close us uh, in prayer, I just want to give you a moment to reflect upon the difficulties in your lives and to also reflect upon the ways that we oftentimes respond impatiently, the ways that we respond in unbelief, the ways that we respond with grumbling and complaining. Will we pray that God would give us a greater perspective, that God would give us a bird's eye view of not only our life, but the life that God is working in generations upon generations. Can we pray that God would help us to have greater faith in the fact that the Lord is coming back, that the Lord is compassionate, that the Lord is merciful. And so as we take a, a minute uh, to respond, let us give him our hurt. Let us give him our hearts. Let's pray at this time.